my grandmother was very musical, a pianist, organist. Uh, my mother was an amateur singer. And so I had a lot of experience uh, with music. And you're being modest because didn't you win any kind of voice award there was? Oh, I did, I did. Uh, I won uh, several um, state voice awards uh, when I was in high school. Did you c figure on a performing arts career? Well, not really. Um, uh, I loved to sing, which I sang in college a fair amount. I really wasn't committed to be a singer, but I also know by, uh, knew by going to a conservatory what your life was like if you were going to be a professional singer. You needed to be very, very good. And even if you were very good, uh, it was a difficult life. Uh, and uh, you either kind of got the breaks or you didn't, but you went from one backstage to another. And I didn't see that as my life of doing that. Despite being a gifted vocalist, Sarah Richards pursued a career in a completely different field, higher education administration. Yet after moving to Hawaii in the mid-70s, she soon found herself on a path that led her right back to the arts. Retired executive director of the Hawaii Theater Center, and before that, the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Sarah Richards, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Sarah Richards is a familiar name in Hawaii's arts community, awarded the 2015 Price Honor by the Hawaii Arts Alliance. A passionate advocate for the arts, Richards is best known for her leadership role in the restoration of the Hawaii Theater, transforming a dilapidated historic theater into a national award-winning performance center. Sarah Richards grew up in the Midwest in the 1940s and 50s. Her family had lived there for generations, but she had no intention of staying. I was born in Sullivan, Indiana, and I grew up in a small town called Washington, Indiana, uh, in southern Indiana. How small? 15,000 people. 15,000 people. My family was from Sullivan, Indiana, about eight generations. But then uh, with my parents, I grew up in Washington. And what kind of school did you go to? In uh, Indiana, it was wonderful. Uh, we lived on about 15 acres outside of town. And so we weren't really farmers, but we had a couple of cows and a couple of horses and dogs. Uh, I went to a, a small uh, four room, eight grade, elementary school through junior high and I went to school with the Amish kids and so it was a lovely place there were 13 students in the class so everybody knew everybody in oh everybody town. Knew, knew everybody uh, in yes and did you like that I loved it I could ride my horse to school and uh, it was also nice because the Amish students were on their their schedule uh, for planting in the spring so our school got out two weeks earlier than <laughs> the kids in town did you think you would leave Washington? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. After high school, I knew I was not going to live there. When did you know that? Oh, I knew that in high, high school. Uh, I, and uh, it was a very nice place to grow up. Uh, it was a wonderful time to grow up. Uh, but no, I really wanted to see the world. Which you did. Which I did. <laughs> uh, what was your next step after high school? I went to the Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, which I went there on scholarship. I was a voice student loved the conservatory. It was magnificent. But you don't get a college education in the conservatory. And I didn't want to get a college education. So you gave up your scholarship? Uh-huh. And I went to DePaul University, which is a liberal arts college in Greencastle, Indiana. I was the third generation to go there. My grandfather had graduated from there, my mother and cousins and aunts and uncles. And uh, I got a wonderful education. I was an English major and a music major. So was, what was the plan? Yeah, this was in the, mm. let's see, this was in the 60s. Yes, I graduated in 63 from college. Uh, so I graduated, and of course, you always would get your teacher's license. And so I got my teacher, teacher's license. You're saying that because of women at the time? Women at that time had three choices. Uh, you could be a teacher, uh, you could be a nurse, or you could go to Katie Gibbs uh, Secretarial School in New York. And it seems to me those, those were the choices. Or you can get your MRS degree. <laughs> were, you, uh, were you affected by the tumult of the 60s? Not really too much. Um, no, not so much. Uh, I, I was not that much. 
I was not sort of out there stomping around and carrying banners. I was a little more conservative than that. And were you interested in the MRS? Uh, not at that time. Not right at the end of college. I was not interested necessarily in getting married. Uh, some of the gals in my sorority were. But no, I was more interested in doing something else. I wanted to travel. So right after <clears throat> college, um, I became a teacher at, in Denver, Colorado. So I taught English and music in Denver, Colorado at the Jefferson County Public School System. And you didn't get to travel. Did you spend a year well, traveling I did. around and I, studying? I did. And so two years after teaching junior high school, I said, that's enough. You need a break. <laughs> and so with a girlfriend, uh, we went to Western Europe uh, for a year. And we, uh, she bought a darling little Volkswagen in Wolfsburg, Germany, and we drove all around. And we sort of were based in Madrid, Madrid Spain. Oh. Uh, and I taught there English as a second language. Uh, and then we, of course, drove all around. And we had friends in Sweden. And so I got to see a lot of Western Europe. How did that affect you the rest of your life? They say travel just broadens you and it has, it, it's a gift forever. Uh, yes, uh, yes, you see a lot. You see the world. You see the way people live, uh, beautiful places, beautiful cities, artwork. Uh, yes, I think your perspective is, is, is widened. And, uh, but I was happy to come home after a year. But uh, it was a terrific experience. But it sort of sets up an appetite to then uh, go back and travel more, which I have since then, of course. Uh, you, you went to graduate school after your travels. After our travels, I came back and went to graduate school at Indiana University. And I, so, um, I got a degree in higher education administration and also in psychology. And I understand you became the very youngest dean ever. I did become a very young dean, yes. Uh, and I was 26, and I became dean of women at Albion College in Albion, Michigan. And if you recall, that was the time of the student unrest. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't trust anybody that was over 30. And so we negotiated non-negotiable demands uh, for all the demands that the students had at the time. And they used to say, throw, throw a rock in the window and say, we will negotiate with no one lower than a dean. And we would reply, there is no one lower than a dean. <laughs> <laughs> and so they didn't have much of a sense of humor. Uh, but I was at Albion, and that was a pretty benign place to be. Um, University of Michigan and Kent State were certainly a lot wilder. So school. you weren't conflicted at all about the generations? No, I wasn't, no. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. And also, being younger, you can relate to the students. But ours weren't really hardcore, mm -hmm. uh, and they were really quite wonderful students. But then if you had a problem, all you did was pick up the phone and call their parents. and that. That took care of it. Uh -huh. um, but that didn't last too long. I did that for two years. And then I, my friends, uh, had friends here in Hawaii who said, get yourself out of southern Michigan. It's cold and snowy. Get yourself out here to Hawaii. Sarah Richards took her friends up on their offer and came to Hawaii to visit. Even though it was just for a summer, it made enough of an impression on her that she decided that this was where she wanted to live. She wasted no time coming back and immersing herself in Honolulu, including getting her MRS, Mrs. Degree. I was recruited from graduate school, actually, at Indiana University uh, in the summer. I was recruited to teach creative writing at Kamehameha Schools. I got here and nobody wanted to take creative writing. Um, so they said, well, we noticed you could teach swimming. So I had a WSI, Red Cross WSI, and so I taught swimming at Kamehameha Schools. Well, that's a, that's a switcheroo. What's a switch? <laughs> well, uh, it, it was, um, I think what it was, was I was in Indiana, and Indiana at that time was the home of the Olympic swim team. And the real swimming coach out there, uh, Sonny Tanabe, had been an Olympic swimmer from Indiana. Uh, so we were all very friendly. and. Uh, I taught swimming from beginning swimming to junior and senior life saving. And it was much better than, than teaching creative writing for the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to back to the And then school. back to graduate school, right? So how did you how did you uh, end up moving here and making your life here? Well well I knew I wanted to live in Hawaii and I think a very big decision you make is do you want to be Dean of Women or a college leader on the mainland, or do you want to live where you want to live? And I decided I would rather live in Hawaii than just be so focused on a higher education career. I was hired as dean of students at Chaminade University. So I came as dean of students at Chaminade from Albion College. Uh, so I was able to keep in the same field, uh, but I liked being out here a whole lot better than Southern Michigan. And um, 
I'm trying to figure out when, when you got married because you... Ah, you, I got married. I came here in 1970 permanently and my husband and I married in 1972. And I met him backstage. I was active then even with the Opera Theater. Uh, I was head of the Education Committee for the Opera Theater and well, I was still dean at, at Chaminade. And he was singing in the chorus. So I met him on, on stage. I eat act two <laughs> backstage. He was dressed up like a fifth century Egyptian priest. <laughs> and my friends were fixing me up with a star who, was a, who sang the role of the king, who's a real opera star, Archie Drake. And uh, anyway, um, but I went to the cast party with, with, with the king. And so then uh, he, that's how we met, was on stage. But then we were introduced at the cast party. In, 19, in, we were introduced in February of 2000, uh, 1972, and we were married in December of 72. So, so much for the king. So much for the king. <laughs> he was 20 years my senior, so I was not too interested. <laughs> and, and, and your husband is, is interesting. Uh, it's an interesting combination because here you are a transplant from yes. the mainland, and you married a, a guy whose family goes back in Hawaii for generations. Right. What was that like? Well, actually, it was, it was wonderful to get, get acquainted uh, with a lot of cousins. So his family came over in the 1820s. Uh, and they were very active. They were members of the Cook family and the Atherton family, but the, the Cooks were very, at that time, um, did the chief's children's school. And uh, so his many cousins uh, have done a lot of things, been leaders in the community. And so it was nice to get to know a lot of people that way. You learn an awful lot about Hawaii's history and just sort of the way of life. But I had come from a small town in Indiana and I had understood about being a kama aina. What that was all about are people who have long roots in one place. And uh, it was, was wonderful. They say um, Hawaii is a tough place to break into if you're, if you're fresh from right. somewhere else and you, you don't give it time. Was it tough for you? Well, uh, initially I felt it was just like a small town. And I understood sort of the ebb and flow of things and the way people relate to one another. So at least in the 1970s, um, it seemed like a very happy place. It was a small town, but it had the advantage of having different cultural groups here, which of course Southern Indiana didn't, but uh, all kinds of different cultures, different people, and I found that very, very stimulating. Sarah Richards' husband is retired scientist and researcher Manning Richards. Sarah Richards started volunteering with the Hawaii Opera Theater six months after arriving in the islands and later became the Opera Theater's board president. Under the board's leadership, the theater, which had been a division of the Honolulu Symphony, became an independent organization succeeding on its own. With her growing reputation in the arts community, Sarah Richards was offered a leadership position at the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, which she decided was too good to pass up, and she left Chaminade University. You succeeded um, a, a man who's got a lot of aura around mm -hmm. him in, in history, yes. Alfred Price, right. as head of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. Right. In 1980? 1980. Mm -hmm. What was he like? Did you know him before you took over? Uh, I, I got to know him. Uh, he was a wonderful man. He was a Prussian architect. And so he was very Prussian uh, in, uh, in character, in, in modus operandi. Uh, and uh, he was one who really initiated the art and public places program really on a European model. He was a lovely man with a great vision. And when it was time for him to step down, mm -hmm. The foundation looked for somebody who uh, was a good administrator mm -hmm. and who could handle the strong voices in the arts community. Yes. And they selected you to do that. They did, they did. What kind of strong voices? Uh, oh, well, the arts, as you know, um, because the State Foundation dealt with all the arts, whether it was visual arts, performing arts, uh, literary arts, and so there was a lot of variety of art groups we were, were dealing with. And of course, uh, since we were the granting agency, uh, that we had a lot of very personal contacts with how much money grants were going to be given to what groups. Right, and projects are like babies. You, oh, yes, you, know, you oh, yes. You give money to one and it's my baby. It, that's right. right. You know, it, it seems like a dream job to have all this money that you could 
you could give to wonderful art projects, uh, but it's, it's probably, no. <clears throat> I mean, you probably are under criticism no matter what you do. Oh, yes, the giving away money is not just a piece of cake. Uh, you need to be clear on what your mission is, what you want to accomplish, uh, and then also who makes the decisions and who are, are qualified to make decisions. It wasn't just sort of, here's some money. And, and you were criticized for not mm -hmm. putting more into mm -hmm. Hawaiian arts. Uh, right. Um, I think some, some people felt uh, I was uh, uh, mainland Halley, and what would I know? So how, how did you, uh, well, how did you uh, handle that? Uh, uh, I found it puzzling at first, because I had grown up in a situation where I guess we didn't have conflicts. And so I felt my job was to do the best I possibly could to get as much money in the state as, in the agency as I possibly could. Um, it helped that my husband was local. Uh, and he could kind of explain a little bit more about how the world works here. And so that, that was very helpful. Well, what, was his, what was his advice? Well, <clears throat> this is the way certain things work. And uh, certain groups have certain opinions on certain things. And just don't take it too personally. Uh, don't take it too personally. And just do the best you possibly can and reach out to whoever had the concern. And uh, so I, I found it hurtful at first because I didn't understand it. Did I feel discriminated, feel racial discrimination? Absolutely, yes. But you just don't, you just go on. Did you think of quitting? I thought about it. I thought about it. But then I thought, no, I cared about what the agency was doing and we were being very successful. For the most part, um, the, the conflict is we tried to get as much as out uh, good art, support all the arts institutions that, we, that were there, and then to purchase art when our little group would go out and, and get artwork. But we spent a lot of time doing a lot of things. Could you show what priorities were and did you have agreed upon priorities? Uh, yes, I think, uh, yes we did. Uh, this is how much money was allocated to each of the, the panel areas. And so what happens if some one person, uh, we didn't buy his or her artwork, they thought they were very upset. And so when you introduce the subject of standards, now that's another difficult uh, concept to get across because, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder uh, or in the eye of the creator, but uh, there are certain standards that the art community has, and that's why you ask a group of knowledgeable people to review and, and, and make a judgment. We were proud. We were number one in the nation in per capita states of support. So and we did a fair amount of lobbying the state legislature uh, and also getting money from, from the federal government. You're a very determined person, aren't you? I'm a determined You're person. You're very goal-oriented. I was very goal-oriented. Yes, I was. And you're yeah. a mission, right. mission person. Yeah. After almost 10 years of working for the state government at the Foundation on Culture and the Arts, Sarah Richards was ready to leave. An opportunity opened at the newly formed Hawaii Theater Center nonprofit organization with a vision to restore the ramshackle downtown theater. With Sarah Richards' fundraising skills, including experience in navigating at the Hawaii State Legislature, Sarah Richards was a perfect candidate to become its first staff member. Beginning, we had a lot of uh, community uh, say this was a really dumb idea. Why are we doing this? You'll never succeed. Well, a lot of people remember, and I remember this as a little kid. Uh, I think Hawaii Theater had turned into a like a movie palace. Exactly, it was all movies. It was. It was. It was not performing arts. Right. It began as a vaudeville theater. Oh. You know, with. Um, backstage, uh, with stage, dressing rooms, orchestra pit. Mm -hmm. So it began in 1922 as a vaudeville theater. It morphed into, in about the 30s, a um, movie theater. Oh, well, I wasn't a kid in the 30s, but right. it must have been no, a no, it was longer that. than that. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, so when we were able to buy the building, we bought the building in fee simple for a million one from the Bishop Estate. Before that, Consolidated uh, Amusement, who built the theater, uh, had a year, month to month uh, lease and they had given that up. And so uh, the status of the building was dreadful. The rats were rampant, the termites were rampant. And so and the but, neighborhood was... And the neighborhood was terrible. <laughs> so it was all bad. The phone system for the um, prostitute center was on the side of my building. 
Uh, so uh, it was pretty bad down there. But um, we knew we, if we were going to make it a success, we needed to do, actually we needed to do three things. We needed to restore the theater, we needed to restore, uh, uh, expand the backstage, and ultimately put an extension onto the theater, uh, and, and part of where the park is today. There was a wonderful group of community leaders who had a vision for what it could be. But meanwhile, we didn't have anything. I bought into the vision of what it, what it could be and how we could, how we could get there. When I went there, um, our consultants, we had a consultant, uh, architectural consultant from New York and a theater consultant, and they said, oh, this is about an $8 million project. Well, about two months after I got there, I realized that this was, at that time, a $22 million project. Had nothing to do with $8 million. And so, what to do? What to do? Just forget it. So we decided to come up with a public-private partnership. And that's, we said, okay, we think we can raise $11 million from the from the private sector, 11 million from the state. And so we put together the public private partnership and then we went forward. So and I, you were the point person at the legislature oh because yes, you got oh yes, to know people. Oh yes, oh yes. But I had a wonderful board of directors of community leaders and they weren't afraid of big numbers. So we had some developers on the board like Diane Plotz and Bill Mills. And uh, we had people like Bob Midkiff, uh, who was wonderful. And so you ha we had a lot of major community uh, leaders who embraced the vision. We raised $32 million. We got 14 of that came from the state legislature over a period of about four, four years. We had three different separate capital campaigns. In the meantime, we uh, started the construction. It took us four years, but we had some certain principles we were um, adhering to, and that was we would do the best job uh, of historic restoration we could. This was not a paint-up, fix-up job. And so we had very high standards of quality of, of restoration. But we had to do everything, uh, all new roof, all new HVAC. And of course it's much more expensive and, and oh. time consuming to do old than build oh, new. M much, much more. All, yeah. all this time you, you, can't, you can't have people in to watch oh. shows because you're building, right? Right. So that right. doesn't help you with fundraising. No. You can't show right. people exactly right. what it could do. Yeah. <clears throat> what happened was in 1995, we had just about finished the interior. But we still had a loan out, five and a half million dollars. Then we had money from the state legislature and Governor Cayetano wouldn't release it. So what to do? Do we just keep fundraising? Keep fundraising? Because we didn't have the money to f uh, finish the outside facade, the marquee and the facade. And the community tell told us, you've raised all this money, what are you doing? And so we raised, we opened the theater before we'd finished the outside facade. And that was, that was the right decision. How do you engage people when they haven't been to the Hawaii Theater to see something and they're not so sure this is going to be a good thing? Well, what you do is you um, first identify if there's been any history uh, that they would have with the theater. So, for example, our first big gift came from Jack Magoon. And Jack Magoon's father had been the treasurer of the Hawaii Theater initially with Consolidated Amusement. And so you had to do your history, if you were doing your research, to find out what people would have, would have connections. And then uh, we'd go after people who, uh, uh, and bring them down there and repaint the picture of what it could be. So you get them involved in what, what could be. Uh, and then, um, as you know, you talk to a lot of, so talk to a lot of people. It's relentless. Uh, you don't stop. Bob Midkiff made it very clear, it's, this is not personal. It's not personal at all. It's about the project and applying what skills you have and knowledge of the people um, to support a project. Back when you um, got your <coughs> master's degree in higher education and educational counseling, right. far cry from right. going right. to well-connected individuals and making mm -hmm. your case. And when you said relentless, it is relentless. I mean, mm -hmm. you're always looking for mm -hmm. um, reaching the next level right. so right. that to fulfill a dream. Right. But it must have been a beating, too, for you. Well, uh, you just have to be convinced of the value. I like fundraising, but it is uh, tiring at times. Uh, it's, as I said, it's relentless. You have to love what you're doing, and you have to be convinced that, that, that the goal is, is reachable or that you can make sure you can get there. You just sort of don't stop. So you are sort of, uh, you're very patient but persevering.
But you always believed you could get it done. I always believed that. I always believed we could get it done. You did it ever get easier? I mean, you raised the money, you restored this theater. I'll tell you what got easier. What got easier was um, people didn't now say you can't do it. If you um, knew all that you'd have to do before you did it, you might not do it. <laughs> uh, th that's true. If you thought too hard, you thought, well, ah, maybe I'd do something else. But I was doing what I loved, and I loved the joy of making it happen. So I love the joy that the theater uh, is built, and also it's beautiful. Uh, and so I wish it well in its future. Sarah Richards retired from her role as president of the Hawaii Theater Center in 2014. In 2015, she was named the Hawaii Arts Alliance Alfred Price Honoree for her advocacy and achievement in arts and arts education in Hawaii. Mahalo to Sarah Richards of Honolulu for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. And after 24 years at the Hawaii Theater Center, mm -hmm. you decided to retire. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was time, it was time, right, for the theater to, you know, and to, to focus on, you know, having new people in and um, take it to a, a new level. But, and also I was ready to do something else. I'd done this for a while. So uh, what I did is I joined the garden club, which was, I learned about uh, gardening. I haven't, hadn't been a gardener before. Uh, and I spent a little more time with the Hawaii Opera Theater and I joined the board of Mission Houses Museum uh, with its interest in history. So uh, I found there was plenty to do.